thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you again, even if it's virtual. So yeah. So today I'm going to talk about mitigating the influences of operational and modeling uncertainties in SHM and some research that I've been uh, pursuing in the last few years. So initially I want to give you a very brief uh, background on why we are interested in SHM. So um, SHM in a broad sense can contribute to resiliency of our infrastructure, for instance, for with, with regard to existing structures like the bridge in Genoa, if we were able to quantify accurately um, uh, the defects in this bridge, we could probably have uh, prevented the collapse. And um, I'm not saying we are yet there to accurately quantify remaining useful life, but um, we are moving towards it. Or for new structures, if we uh, are able to uh, monitor the behavior and the performances of uh, novel designs or uh, existing structures, we can come up with better design ideas. So uh, the contributions of SHM can be twofold for both existing and then new structures. Um, this is a strong structure next to many weak ones, which after a mass of a hurricane, uh, you can see this is the only one standing there. So, but then uh, when dealing with uh, infrastructure, we have certain problems that we don't have in other aspects. So you can see that when you're looking for making decisions about parking, it's very easy. You put sensors, it tells you how many, it's a binary uh, quantity. You directly measure what you are looking after. When dealing with the air pollution, it's the same refute uh, collection roads can be optimized the same way because there's direct correlation, there's directly measurements related to what we're looking for. But uh, when dealing with uh, operational structural systems, that is not the case. At least uh, when the damage is in the early stage, you cannot directly measure it. There's no way to measure the damage. You have a sparse network of sensors, you sense structural response, and then um, you directly measure the response, but indirectly estimate the damage. That's why this uh, uh, this necessity for indirectly estimating the damage uh, causes a lot of problems. Uh, there, there could be four types of, four categories for uh, structural health monitoring. The first level would be using some data from the structure, which I denoted this sensor and some data analytics. And this can be uh, done in an unsupervised machine learning framework. The next level would be to use a model and um, generate some uh, damage scenarios and train uh, uh, a supervised machine learning algorithm for damage detection. But in this case, data analytics, most of it is done beforehand and then uh, as the data comes, we can get uh, health information from the structure. So you see a model. So whenever you see a model, you might think of modeling uncertainty as well. The other approach could be physics-based system identification where as the data becomes available, you update this model and do damage detection. And then the last stage and probably the most important one would be damage prognosis, which is the question of how long the structure will sustain because we know many of our structures are faulty. Like many engineers when walking in the street can identify with eye, with naked eye, how many bridges are problematic, but they can't tell you how long will, it, will they sustain. The same goes with certain other structures, but this requires integration of degradation models in this framework, which is again, another uh, story. So today um, I will talk about um, aspects of improvements I've done in unsupervised machine learning, supervised machine learning, and uh, physics-based uh, system ID uh, with my co-workers. And um, um, before going uh, toward that, I just want to mention that um, 
uh, SHM has not become industrialized yet. Uh, in fact, indeed, uh, according to Chuck Farrard, which is one of the pioneers in the field, um, in 2012, he was talking about this fact that um, SHM has not progressed beyond uh, lab scale work for the most part. In 2020, still in 2021, I guess, still if you read the um, uh, review papers, this is from 2018, but still the, the situation is the same. Um, you don't have a, an algorithm that can address all aspects of all challenges at the same time. That's why we are slowly, we, you don't see any company uh, having a kind of software package that does the work for you and uh, can be versatilely moving from this structure to the other. So why is that? Um, because when dealing with large, inf large scale infrastructure system, you have environmental variability, you have input variability as we call it in system ID, but it's operational uncertainty because you don't know what kind of traffic is um, exciting the structure or what kind of um, ground excitation, seismic actions. You have modeling uncertainties um, and um, we have sensor cost and you know the, 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 the more accurate the sensor, the more expensive it is. And um, that has motivated me working in multiple domains to try to come up with a, with a sort of framework that can provide a scalable solution for, for this uh, problem. I'm not there yet, but I'm just working towards it. And uh, what I will talk about today will address these three on top. So with my colleagues, I'm working towards that uh, a scalable solution that takes a response from various kinds of sensors, relays it uh, to the cloud and provides decision analytics for uh, decision makers. And uh, you will see that I have multiple projects that kind of might seem a bit uh, detached from each other, but they are working towards the same goal. And in this seminar, I will talk about um, one unsupervised machine learning for bridge damage detection project, then transfer learning for dealing with the modeling errors in supervised machine learning for SHM, and um, input state estimation via minimum variance and bias smoothing. And then we'll have conclusions and the question and answer. So, um, the work I'm uh, presenting in this, uh, in this part of the seminar is uh, part of PhD work of a student uh, at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I, when I was there, um, we worked a lot. And uh, he's Emmanuel uh, Kintunde. He will probably graduate in a couple of years, but I just want to acknowledge his work. So when I was in Nebraska, I was lucky enough to have the chance to get access to this crash test. So this is a part of a bridge. I put this um, finite element mesh on top. So you see kind of, uh, this is a segment of a bridge. And the objective of this test was to design safe guardrails uh, in an optimal fashion. Uh, but the group that does it is located in Nebraska and they allowed me to instrument this bridge before and after the crash and test it. So the crash test, for people who do SHM, work in damage detection or identification, often finding a structure that they can damage is a challenge. But the benefit of this structure was that um, you can also uh, ride a vehicle on it. So if you want to load it, you can actually use some cars and drive through it and excite it and make it a realistic case study. Uh, so this is another video. So the project was funded by 19 US DOTs, uh, including Nebraska, obviously. And uh, after the crash, however, we figured out that there's not visible cracks. There are not visible cracks in the location of the crack. So we also put some uh, other sorts of damage, but they will talk about it more. 
So the, the number of sensors I put on this structure were large because I didn't know what I'm gonna get. But these are strain gauges in two directions. Um, we're measuring in two directions, X and Y, let's say. And uh, we attached 40, I guess, if I'm not wrong, but, or 42, um, but I used a subset of them because um, we realized that was a very dense mesh. And uh, so, like I said, um, we had the chance to ride, uh, drive real vehicles over the bridge. So I'm actually in this dump truck, um, but riding through. And uh, I show you this video so that you see there's nothing I did. Some days were rainy, some days were not rainy. And uh, it was not really, maybe there's a little bit of environmental variability that disperses data. So this is the healthy segment of the bridge and this is bridge after impact, but after the impact on the back of this uh, guardrail where there is uh, this target, uh, we didn't see really cracks and these are Sharpie markings for sensor locations, etc. cetera. And uh, that's why uh, we use this, uh, we, we use a saw to cut through the deck and uh, through the guardrail. So we have three levels of damage. One is the impact, bridge after impact. So uh, Imano came up with bait for this. So we have healthy bridge, bait, and guardrail damage, guardrail and slab cut damage. So um, I just want to show you the, the, the envelope for various, oh, so I have to also add that um, to make sure we have um, variability in loads, we had this dump truck full and empty, full and empty. It didn't have an odometer, so we didn't run this with different speeds. We just tried to be kind of uh, safe. And most of the runs were with this, uh, with this, with the velocity, with the, with the speed you saw. And then we had this small truck, uh, which we ran it uh, in five different uh, speeds, five miles per hour, 10 miles, 15. So we have kind of five five levels of uh, variability in load. So three different uh, three different weights and three different speeds, and to you know kind of you can see that uh, the load was varying. Well. And this is the envelope of the the strains from one of the sensors. You can see that um, this is just for the healthy bridge, and from small truck to uh, field dump truck. Um, you have a lot of variability. So this is 20 micro strains. This is almost five micro strains in amplitude. And after the impact, you can see that there is some change, but you can't really understand anything. So this is just justifying feature extraction for damage identification. The feature we used was the proper orthogonal modes. So in these um, four subplots, you can see healthy bridge, after impact, rail guard damage, uh, guard rail damage, and um, slab damage. And these are each of which uh, can show you, I will annotate uh, each of these is one POD mode. And uh, these are vehicle passages. Uh, so you can see that the, the POD modes uh, do not change much um, for one vehicle, I mean, there is some change, but the damage influences much more uh, the feature. Um, with field dump truck, there's a still, you can see that when the weight changes, there is some change, but the still you can understand that the damage is the most uh, influential factor. This is a small truck with uh, different speeds. So, uh, this tells us that we can use novelty detection using POD modes, and uh, the novelty index was very simple. Um, the norm of variation from normal, this is uh, the mean of the proper modes when the bridge is healthy, and then um, this novelty index can clearly show that uh, in the healthy stage we have some variability, but the level is kind of uh, in between something between 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. But then when the impact happens, it goes up, even if this was invisible by naked eyes. 
you can see that there's appreciable change in novelty index. And then if you make a saw cut, there's one more jump. And then finally, uh, this is socket of the deck uh, guardrail. And this is socket of the deck. So um, if we use 24 sensors, we get this kind of novelty index. You can see that um, there's clear distinction between various stages. If we use only four sensors, which are spread in here, one, three, five, seven, and this is the impact area, you can see that um, the, this, damage, this level of damage cannot be distinguished well from that. So bridge after impact test uh, features are kind of similar to um, guardrail damage. So this might not be the most realistic bridge ever, right? So we also work towards testing some decommissioned bridges in the middle of Nova, in Nebraska. This is one of those. I took this video. So it's not a very large bridge, but um, the problem is mostly actually with smaller bridges. They don't cost much, so instrumentation just to really come up with very and um, we ran this kind of truck, a U-Haul truck. This is actually, I'm not sure the exact truck was ran on this, but uh, this was the kind of vehicles we rented for testing these bridges because we had to remove these fences, et cetera, and then run, uh, ride, drive the cars on this dirt road. Um, we didn't do it, we didn't, have also the time to make some load variability. So this was the only, the only car in this case. And if you wanna see the typical, so we tested three of these bridges and a typical, and all were concrete, concrete deck on girder. And uh, the magenta one shows the girders. This is a plan view, the girders and um, the gray mesh shows the concrete. So we have strange transduc transducers on the bottom of these um, girders and damage, we induced some damage. And the damage to level one was to cut part of the flange and the level two of damage was cutting through the web. And that was done by um, Peter, our lab manager. So many, many people helped in these projects because uh, there's a lot of work that is invisible. And um, it's not easy to acknowledge everyone's work, but then um, I just want to show you the signals. So you see signals from different sensors. How do they look? They look like this. So we did some, um, I adjusted some peaks to make them consistent. And then we applied some windowing to so you when you calculate the features, they're still more consistent. You don't have so many zeros in, in your window. And this is the type of um, feature, purely mode, you get from the string data. The black lines are the healthy or baseline purely modes. You see multiple lines because of multiple runs of the vehicle. And uh, these show sensor numbers. And this is for damage one. This is for damage two, this is for damage three, and this is for damage four. And the stages of damage show various intensities in various locations. So if you're wondering how this shows up in a novelty index, this is the way it looks. So your vehicle passage and the horizontal axis, you see that we had 50 vehicle passages uh, this is for healthy stage, obviously, because the novelty index is very low. So you see that in the bridge deck case, uh, the novelty index was starting from 0.1. That's because of, uh, I guess, variability of the lows, as well as um, so many other factors, like um, some days they're rainy, some days they're not. So the, the approaches of that bridge segment were changing constantly. And this is novelty index for another bridge of that type. So you see that this novelty detection using proper orthogonal mode 
is a very strong method for uh, damage detection. I'm just saying detection because it can, cannot characterize its type. So, like I said, bridge damage detection is not now possible in presence of load uncertainty and measurement noise. So I don't have figures in here just for the sake of bre uh, brevity, but um, these uh, features, proper level modes, are very robust to noise. Like you get at 20% Gaussian noise, you get the same feature. And these are actually some methods for damage for some of the methods for canceling noise in image analysis are built around QD. So, uh, so moving to a more, um, say, informative, um, a, a more informative framework for damage detection. So, in novelty in the in novelty detection, you don't get any any um, understanding of damage because you just figure out there's something going wrong. But what's going wrong could be understood by supervised machine learning. And uh, majority of this work uh, was done by Ahmed Raga. He's uh, now a doctor actually. Um, he graduated a couple of years ago or no last year. And now he works at a company Focus on SHM. And um, this was a part of his doctoral work. And I was closely working with him on the, on the development of this work. So, coming back to this theme, this fits um, right here. And um, predominantly, we're trying to work on this and understand how you can use an uncalibrated model for generating damage scenarios. Because if you think about it, in US alone, there are 600,000 bridges. If you want to develop supervised machine learning methods for damage detection of the 600,000 methods, you have to calibrate 600,000 bridges, bridge models. Is it viable? Not so. But then the good news is that a large number of these bridges have lots of common features. Like the railway bridges, most of them were built around uh, early 20th century, and uh, they feature same structural system. So, if you can come up with an idea that you can use a model which has a, the right class, let's say, right uh, class, and you just don't know the values of the parameters accurately and uh, you would need a test to do that. So if the, the degree of accuracy of the model is that, that much, and you can still do supervised machine learning, probably that's good because you can reduce say uh, 600,000 model, model calibration to just um, maybe very few because you don't need to calibrate, you just need to come up with the right model class and then maybe potentially use the model you used for one dam and one bridge in Nebraska, you can use the same model to a bridge in Zurich because they have the same, they have similar features. So let me, how to get rid of this. Yeah, so when we, deal with um, supervised machine learning, we have some finite element models for the first HM, and we run direct analysis to generate damage scenarios, but uh, inputs and parameters are uncertain. So the question is how close is the match? And uh, we want to avoid costly inverse analysis for calibrating the model for going back to this. Uh, so look at this bridge. The, Work, the case study I worked on for the most part in Nebraska was this bridge and some rural bridges. It's, you saw the test in rural bridges, but vehicular bridges, but uh, you can look at this. This is a bridge which was built in 1908. And uh, it has these connections, which are a major concern for the owner, which is the company. 
And these were designed as hinge, but they don't behave as hinge, they behave as kind of fixed. So they develop uh, fatigue cracks in these connections. And the owner of the bridge said, if you can come up with an idea to detect these quantitatively, do the great because they have to inspect these bridges very regularly. And um, in some cases, there, there were some uh, collapses in these hinges. And um, that led to derailing of the train. That's a major concern because the rail is directly on top of these girders, the stringers. So uh, the supervised machine learning that we developed for this was based on classification and then regression. Classification was for uh, classification of the loads because you need to know what track is loaded. These are dual track uh, bridges. And you can do it with machine learning, that's not a big deal, but also we found some features that could help us uh, classify how heavy the, the, the train was. And um, if you find like the heaviest trains, it's easy. It, it makes your life easy because they have a cap for weights, obviously, and many of the train wagons hit that cap. So we generated lots of damage scenarios and then um, we use again POD modes as damage features. And uh, we developed this method for that. But then we figured out if the model is not very well calibrated, the accuracy of damage detection goes very low. So uh, we also should know that uh, because these connections are in each stringer to floor beam connection, uh, these, sorry, these uh, unknown uh, parameters are there. The fixity of them is unknown and then uh, the damage is also linked to that. We have 40 damage indices for just one simple bridge. We installed 20 strain sensors um, trying to detect those. And by the way, at some point there was a huge flood, historic flood uh, that took our sensors down. So we don't, we no longer have this uh, sensor network there. It was a very nice sensor network sending the data through the system uh, to our lab. So I talked about the bridge. Uh, I want to skip this and show you some load classification results that we got from real, real data. So this is uh, strain time histories um, that we got from, I think, for three months worth of train passage. So you can see that there is a mess. If you just take the POD modes of raw, raw data, it's a mess. There is no consistency. It's almost like the raw data. But then we did some uh, zero removing and we had some more consistency in there. We did peak picking automatically. All of this was automatic, is automatic actually. So it can be implemented in an automatic fashion. And uh, with peak picking, the consistency came uh, much lower, but then we did um, sort the signals based on RMS to pick just the heaviest trains. And this was the end results for, for that bridge for many, many train passages. But this is the variability from real signals. Um, what is the variability from model? So if the model class is correct, let's say M0 is a model class that is correct, but has some parameters which are uniform. So all of the stringer to floor beam connections are um, um, assigned uniformly. Then you have M1, which is model class one, which has 80% uh, more rigidity in stringer to floor beam connections. Then you have model class two, which is 50% softer in stringer to floor beam connection. So 80% harder, 50% softer. This is a huge variation, I would say. And uh, if you have M3, which is randomly varying from the baseline model, and M4, which varying, randomly varies, but 
to a higher degree, and finally M5, which is varying 100% with respect to M0. So also the range varied like this because we generated some random numbers which turned out to give this variation. So then for a certain sensor, you can see that uh, from the legend, you can see we have M0 to M5, five different levels of uh, model variability. And then the black line is for baseline. So you see that when you make the, when you make the, uh, this spring harder, you can see that there's some change in the response, but the most uh, variability is for M4. But this is random in different um, locations. These are different sensor locations. And it's a 3D model, so uh, you, you cannot really find a direct uh, a linear variability between all locations. Some locations, that's true, but because uh, then these uh, stringer to floor beam connections sustain axial stress as well, that changes uh, combined with flexural stress in weak and strong axis, it can really change it. So long story short, the models show feature so much variability. So how to do damage detection using this much variability? These are POD modes for uh, different model classes in different damage uh, situations because uh, this track was loaded. So sensor 10 to 20 showed another track. So there's so much variability in this part here, if you notice. So what to do? There's so much difference. So we came up with the idea that if you uh, find the shifts in POD modes, when we call it delta P, delta palm, which means the, the difference between POD mode before and after damage, for most model classes, they are kind of the same. I mean, they're not the same exactly, of course, because there's, uh, they cannot be identical, but if there is, for instance, damage in close to sensor 18, you can see that uh, delta palm is significantly different from zero when compared to the other locations at this location. So, and we, we thought, okay, we can use delta palms for transferring the learning from model to real field because you have the baseline healthy palms from field anyway. Right, so you have sensor data, real sensor data. Then what if you add these delta palms from model to palm from sensor, you have transferred the learning for damage scenarios from model to field, from model to reality. So this is the process that we did. Uh, we followed for transferring the learning from model to the field. I can talk about it in detail afterwards because I don't want to run out of time. So, but in short, the, the purity modes for a field signals in damage scenario cannot be obtained because the damage have not happened. And even if it has happened, it's just one scenario. So you have to kind of approximate this you have to uh, approximate this guy uh, using the POD modes from field in healthy stage plus POD modes from model in damaged state. And then you can use these features uh, for damaged condition for training and artificial neural network and regression model for damage section. And if you want to see what is the performance of this method, um, it's here. So when there's no damage, so let me explain you what is uh, what is this. So here we have damage locations from one to twenty, let's say. Each each of which shows damage in proximity of one of the sensors installed. And these show uh, the train passages. We have used 10 trains for testing this regression network. And these 10 train IDs 
the loads were obtained from the bridge owner. So these are real, real, um, so let me see, I have a question. I see a message from, um, so these are train IDs that um, we did not use for training the regression network. So let me and then if we have 40% damage at damage location as 40% damage in sensor location three, we can see that uh, across the train IDs, we can kind of find um, we have some errors, but we can kind of identify there's some damage happening in here. The intensity is captured sometimes well, sometimes not, but with statistical analysis, obviously you can locate it. If you have more significant damage in another say sensor location, you have more pronounced uh, detection of the damage. As it goes higher, you have more distinctive damage detection. So, the conclusion is that again, transfer learning can help using an uncalibrated model. And uncali the, calib the amount of uncalibration is like, um, significant to generate damage scenarios for a real structure. And the reference is in here. Um, I encourage you to go read it. And uh, we can talk about it after the uh, seminar as well. I think it's a very realistic. Um, study. We didn't induce real damage on the structure, but still that was significant. So the third subject I want to talk about is input state estimation via minimum variance and bias uh, smoothing. So the main reference for this work is uh, this paper and um, my friend and colleague Mohsen um, has done the main job. And he got his PhD um, in August, I guess. So this was uh, part of his PhD work at Monash University. So let me move this a little bit. So because this might sound a bit um, rushed, um, I just want to come with the uh, some problem definition. This is a little bit different from machine learning. So then a little bit about comma. I want to talk about a little bit what common filter wants to do. And then then we deal with mod input uncertainty, for instance, um, what augmented common filter can do for you. And then what was the motivation behind using minimum variance and bias filters. And then uh, eventually why we move towards smoothing and show you some results from the smoothing that we developed. Um, so we have an actual system. So I have this uh, photo of Pirelli Tower because uh, I like the structure. This is in uh, Milan's uh, central station, close to Milan's central station, central train station. Um, I studied in Milan, so I walked around this building a lot. And I used it for part of my PhD work, uh, the model. So we have some partial observations from this actual system, and we have some assumed models. So we want to find the best estimate of the system state using these partial observations and the model. So there is noise in the data, observed data. Um, I just want you to be familiar with the notation. We use Y for uh, noisy observations. And we have some modeling error, obviously, because of uh, what we talked about. So we put some assumptions on the modeling error. The modeling error here is denoted by W. The measurement noise is denoted by V. And you can, uh, you can notice that uh, this might sound a little bit unrealistic in the structural systems, because modeling error might not be always uh, white. Uncorrelated, but you know, so uh, um, to facilitate certain theoretical developments, derivations, we assume the noises are 
Gaussian and uncorrelated. If there's correlation, we can account for it, but uh, it, this time the assumption of Gaussianity leads to simplifications for linear systems. So how it works is that uh, we want to develop a, uh, a recursive Bayesian estimate of the state X, we denote it by X hat, uh, by optimal data fusion. So if this is uh, X according to the model, and this is uh, this distribution of Y, Kalman filter recursively fuses these informations to come up with a posteriori estimate of uh, the state using measurement or model. So it's based on initialization. So you assume some initialization for your filter, then in prediction and update recursively, um, you optimize X hat um, as the data becomes available from the sensor. But uh, the problem is that uh, when dealing with Kalman, you need to know what's the system input. And the system input in operational cases can be unknown, at least for the structure subjected to non-stationary excitation. So uh, one approach for dealing with this is augmented Kalman filtering, where the unknown input is augmented to the state vector. So the new state vector is called um, Z. And um, we come up with this state space equation where we have these augmented state uh, and observation matrices. So curly A looks something like this, if you, if you will. And then we assume a fictitious input evolution model. So this assumption can be problematic because uh, it might not work for in general case. So there are two um, observation equations based on having or not having the input in the observation process. The systems that have uh, the unknown input in the, in the observation process are called systems with direct feed through and systems who do not have it are called systems without direct feed through. So based on these, uh, existence and non-existence of input in observation process, the, um, the derivation for minimum variance on bias filters can vary. So the, indeed, there are two filters uh, developed by Gillen and Demur, that one is for um, systems with direct filters and one is for systems without direct filters. So, uh, and uh, in, this in this study, we are focused on systems uh, without direct feed through. Because uh, in a structural vibration, the systems without direct feed through are those who have pure strain measurements, for instance, or pure displacement measurements, which can come from uh, maybe computer vision, if you use computer vision or some sorts of novel paints or whatever like that for sensing the structure's response, you're gonna come up with systems without direct features. So this is a pretty important class of systems. But if you have acceleration in your measurements, you're gonna have- Just yes. a small comment that normally we need to leave a bit of time for uh, questions. Uh -huh. So it would be good to, if uh, you could slowly start wrapping up so we have a, at least 10 minutes. For the okay, okay. I didn't know uh, how long I had. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, I should have explained. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, there is, I will skip most of uh, the revision. I will show you some results from the smoothing. So you see what, what will be the problem. So the problem is that um, I will also tell you what is the smoothing versus filters. So if this is model predictions, and these are observations that are available, time k, k minus one, uh, et cetera. So the filter works, it gets the, um, it's the um, model prediction from time k and measurement from time k, it comes up with this uh, estimate of uh, x and d k minus one, because we're talking about systems without direct feature. Then a smooth thing works, like this, it gets uh, observation by K, um, 
sorry, the model uh, YK and the observation from multiple steps. Let's say N steps forward and provides the estimate of X hat and B hat. So in a sense, smoothing uses more time steps of observation and this can, this can help us in certain cases. So the thing is that um, the problem is that uh, the filtering modeling, the, the filtering problem for systems without direct fit through, when you have pure displacement measurements, um, is an ill posed problem because, because there is delay between, um, because there's a delay between um, actual sensing and um, when the sense when there's, for instance, load was applied. So we can mitigate that with um, increasing the interval in which uh, the observation was um, measured. So, so this is, if deal, when dealing with this uh, purely uh, tower, we have, um, for instance, this estimates for input with MVU filter. And uh, with our novel smoothing, we could reduce um, the uncertainty of estimates significantly. However, this was the first version of uh, the smoothing that we developed. And uh, when we add the velocity measurements, it makes it uh, very, very good. But this is the performance of MU filter with uh, velocity. Um, we figured out that um, uh, we figured out that some improvement in the gain of uh, smoothing, we're using a pseudo inverse instead of an inverse in one location, in one of in calculating the gain, can significantly improve um, the performance of the smoothing by uh, this much. So, for 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 another example, a moving load example. This is not published yet. We are working on the manuscript. But if you have this uh, moving load problem and um, the displacement is used, we have just used displacement measurements for uh, calculating the, the load, the moving load intensity. If we use the modified smoothing with modified gain, we can have this estimate of the load. And if we use the field, um, the old smoothing with not modified gain, we can have this kind of um, noise. So this was the case also with the filter, but I'm not uh, gonna work on talking about it now. So these are displacements of uh, unmeasured displacements of the same beam subject to the moving load. And uh, you can see that with this modified smoothing, we have a much better estimate using just displacements and five person measurement mode. So we also, um, with this um, smoothing, we had a novel um, way for updating in a smoothing algorithm to, to update uh, the covariances that significantly accelerated, uh, significantly reduced the runtime. So for more details, I encourage you to read this paper. It's uh, just, just published in August um, and uh, it's available for, it's available online for you to read it. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that um, I'm working on addressing some problems of modeling input and measurement uncertainty and some of them are resolved. And um, some parts of work was validated for large scale systems. And with this, I'm open to your questions. Thank you very much, Said. Uh, I think we can open that's the floor for uh, questions. And apologies if I didn't ask you to keep it a bit shorter. Usually we leave some time for the questions to the audience. Sure, sure. But I thought it was a very good overview and you touched upon different topics from detection, use of machine learning methods to uh, use of these filters, which is more for the aspect of virtual sensing, let's say. Um, so I would like to ask the audience to pose their questions either in the chat or simply raise your uh, 
hand virtually or even unmute yourselves if you have a question. Maybe a first question from me in much of what you show, you refer at least for what you refer um, in the context of machine learning, um, you presented in the beginning an unsupervised approach, uh, but then it was not clear to me later on when you discussed the use of different models with different reductions and different simulated scenarios of damage. Do you need to create such a process so that you can use these as labels or as training data for your machine learning algorithm? And I ask because in, in general, I consider it a bit of a, uh, always a mishap or, or a disadvantage if we need to use simulated scenarios of damage through our model to train. So, so, you, so you're asking why did I, uh, why, we, why did I talk about um, in this case, right? Where uh, we I had... think you have a case with some scenarios that allow, uh, exactly. So here are these yeah. scenarios that you need to devise. So do you need to artificially no. produce many of these or is it, are these only found, found out? Uh, no, we, we try to show if the model is so much variable. No, we were just trying to see what features could be used for damage Mm -hmm. which are robust to modeling error. So we, we, we tested models with different levels of error with respect to the, you, you know, the mm -hmm. baseline. So we, we just need to use one of these models for damage detection eventually. Oh, okay. But we just want to show that if, even if the model is so much different from the other one in terms of uh, stringer to floor beam connection stiffness, um, the delta palm is very close uh, in all cases, but the purity mode itself is not. Mm -hmm. So if you want to transfer learning from one wrong model to field, uh, you can use delta purity modes instead of purity modes themselves. Okay. Yeah, so no, this is not that uh, we need to generate lots of variable models. It's yes, just a, uh, because that would probably yeah. be a, a, somehow a weakness. But if that's yeah. the case, then you can claim that you don't need to have therefore some, some sort of uh, prior simulation. So in a sense, this is an unsupervised approach to this. Uh, to we, still have to, we, we still have to have one model to mm -hmm. generate damage scenarios. If you want to detect, we need at least one model. Ah, but that's my question. How many, what do you mean to generate damage scenarios? So, so, so if you want to, so if you want to see what intensity of damage is occurred where? And what is the characteristics of it? Mm -hmm. Your regression network needs to know. Uh, so you so you, this for... means, uh, if we go back to my question, then you do need to simulate artificial scenarios of damage yeah. in locations where, you, yeah. What I was yeah. saying is that in my mind, uh, for complex structures, this can be a bit of a weakness because it's not easy to try and generate all of those situations and combinations of uh, multiple defects that could exist on a structure. True, uh, that's true. It can be a weakness, but um, if you don't have a, so if you are just interested in novelty detection. Exactly, in that case, I don't think it's so much of a weakness because it's just a difference to a baseline. Yeah, that's a in the point. novelty detection case, in these cases, no model was used. Yeah, exactly. No model was used, but if you want to go one step further than that and see, mm -hmm. uh, and see what is the extent of damage, right? Because here with the novelty detection, you can see there's more diverse, um, there's more deviation from normal, but you cannot see how many percent of damage where is exactly. Okay, so then my question would be: Do you think we could figure out a bit more by at least relying on the distribution of sensors on the system? Yeah, yeah, probably. you can do that. If that's yeah, what your yeah. model shapes criterion probably to the point. Out. Yeah, if you have uh, if you have a very dense network of sensors, you can understand better about mm -hmm. the location, etc. But also in this case, uh, you're right. Uh, generating damage scenarios for complicated models is difficult, and this is a relatively complicated model because 3D there are lots of elements. I know that it's not a it's not an airplane structure, but Still, it has lots of complexities. But what makes it very difficult to use a model for generating damage scenarios is modeling uncertainties. Like if you, if you need to calibrate the model 
and match these responses to the field. So you see that the, the strain response here uh, across the model are so uh, different. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you can use an uncalibrated model for gen generating damage scenarios, it, it makes the life much easier. Okay, I see. Ima imagine if you were using a calibrated model, then you have to uh, stop the traffic, you know, run an optimization, find out what are the values of these 40 stranger to floor beam connections, um, you know, like the section modifiers. There's, there are at least 50 to 60 parameters for just this span. Right. If you, needed, if you wanted to really calibrate this and then generate the damage scenarios, it would be not practical in industry, I would say. Maybe mm -hmm. academically it's fine, but, but the interesting aspect of this work or using transfer learning in general is that you just waive that for that aspect. You remove, mm -hmm. you eliminate the necessity for calibrating. So, so I, may, I, may I ask a question? Sure. I, I might have missed that, but I think that in, in, in your two case studies, you almost exclusively or exclusively use train gauges, right? Is, is there any yes. particular reason to that? Yeah, with this bridge, yes. Uh, with this bridge, uh, the rails are directly on the stringers. And if you put accelerometers, it just goes above the range that they get because there's impact uh, wave sensed by accelerometer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but then I guess that you reduce, you reduce the, the, the effective frequency band of your measurement, right? I mean, because, because strain gauges are, let's say, by default low pass and maybe the impact can give you some information regarding uh, some local phenomena, right, or no? It can, but but honestly, how, like it, it goes above 5G. So when the train was passing through this uh, structure, we put some accelerometers and uh, it was going above the range of this, like the accelerometer. They, they were precise accelerometers like PCB. We weren't able to get any meaningful things then yeah if you're interested in wave propagation and finding damages using that maybe mm -hmm. somebody could but uh, the, the kind of phenomena that you get with those accelerometers is not uh, bending it's yeah. wave mm -hmm. propagation installed and you know so we, we couldn't use that practically but also we had 108 sensors that time in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. and only few accelerometers this is also why i put mostly strain gauges okay okay so i mean th this this comes to, to my, the second part of my question which is a, a, also a bit related to what you discussed with eleni before uh, okay the localization problem and the propagation and the identification of damage it's it's a very difficult problem eventually you have to have a, let's say a damage uh, damage uh, evolution model and so on but there is always this critical question when it comes to purely detection, to, 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 to have a yes or no on whether there is damage on a structure. And my question is, in this scale of structures, can you do that with a single sensor? With a single sensor? No. Yes. I, I mean, so let's say, sensor? can you install, uh, also, Christoph sent, sent a comment, I think, maybe maybe we can discuss it a bit, but but if you if you apply a single sensor on a wind turbine or on a bridge, can you say whether there is damage or not? Not localization, not detect, not identification, just purely yes or no on, on SHM level one. I mean, maybe somebody can, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> so, I cannot, <laughs> if it's uh, what I will. Because for me, this is a very interesting question. And also it, it relates to the moving sensor problem that, that, you, that you presented eventually, you, you, you but, but that, that's a topic for, for discussion, I would say. Yeah, it's a, you know, like what, what that sensor gives you, is it like a one sen accelerometer, one strain gauge or what? So I guess if the local damage is ha happening, no, you cannot find that uh, with just one sensor. But if you have a continuous, I don't know if you have a very high fidelity paint or a strain gauge that you paint the structure, it gives you full field measurements. There are these paints that are being developed. I don't say yeah, yeah, that's ready, but, but that's one sensor or multiple, I don't know. 
so actually, Christoph, yeah. Christoph, Christoph Mais from Leuven posed the question. I don't know if you can see it on chat and, and yeah. have your, uh, yeah, your reply. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So you're right, Christoph. The thing is, um, um, real, accurate modeling of damage is not easy, and sometimes it's even practical. But then, what happens is that with with this type of structure, uh, the owner said that. The cracks that develop in the angles here are their main concern. And um, the behavior of this connection is far from linear. However, um, there is a there's an author in Chalmers, Chalmers University. He cut some of these uh, connections and took them to lab. Not exactly this one from this bridge, but very similar connections. And tested them, I showed that it's uh, um their behavior is almost i mean you can approximate it by some sort of linearity but then also that uh, as the crack propagates in the angle uh, the bend the rotational stiffness uh, decreases so we try to say okay um, we don't care about how how much is the length of the crack here but we just want to say we identify the the reduction in this stiffness coefficient so we assume that the stringer to fluorine connections are linear and um, if we if you detect any reduction in this linear coefficient we have identified some sort of damage this was the way we thought about it but if you want to make a case to was justified this is the most precise no it is not I, I don't claim but realistically speaking if you have 40 of these spring you know connections and um, you want to identify them in operational conditions with noise and you know everything else that might be in variability in loads this was what we thought was probably appropriate but if you have better suggestions uh, we are open really to the suggestions. Sure. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Yes, I have a quick question on uh, the machine learning algorithms that you use. Can you elaborate a little bit more about the specifics of which type of machine learning algorithm was best or was uh, uh, preferred by your group? And uh, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so the, we used a, here we used um, a feed forward um, artificial neural network with two layers. Uh, one is the input layer, the other is the hidden layer. Let's say three out, three layers, input, output, and some one middle layer. And uh, you know, there's mathematical proof that uh, this kind of network can uh, approximate any nonlinear function. But uh, I didn't I didn't try deep networks that have more memory and they're less they're less prone for overfitting. Um, so I was focused on seeing how we can uh, address uh, the influence of um, input variability. So we had one classification. Uh, before, so it's, it was a hierarchical process. There's one classification uh, level, the one classification network, and then one regression one. So I don't think this is the best approach, but the most of work was focused on, like I said, mitigating influence of modeling uncertainty and input uncertainty and measurement noise. So the features that we use are delta palms, which are very robust to measurement noise. We are, I also showed that for this kind of structure, they're robust to modeling uncertainty. So you can use an uncalibrated model, use um, relatively cheap sensors, and uh, come up with this. Can we improve this regression? Yes, perhaps we can improve it and get better results. Maybe if we use more number of layers, you know, because they have right. larger memories. Thank you very much. Ah, sure.
Um, are there any more questions from the audience? I ask because we have slightly also exhibited uh, our uh, amount of, or our duration, uh, mm -hmm. but that happens uh, sometimes. I don't see someone raising their hand. Uh, in which case, Said, I would like to actually thank you very much for this presentation and give the word back to you to leave us with a closing statement. So what would be the closing message you want to leave on this topic for the audience? Um, uh, I would like to say uh, if we try like in one research group, I know you're doing that, uh, we try to address multiple aspects of uh, uh, multiple aspects of uh, health monitoring challenges to come up with, uh, with something that works. It might be a better idea than at this point because I see there are lots of progresses in independent, uh, say in, in various aspects of SHM, but we don't have any industrialized uh, product. You know, I think it would be great if uh, if we focus more on coming up with something that works for even you know at some level of functionality, and then um, go in depth in. You mean the value of prototypes, having prototype yeah, yeah, implementations exactly. that are yeah. shown to work. Yeah, I think yeah. many are trying. We as well, we're trying to put out benchmarks of this type just to prove. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I see that you're moving towards that as well. But it's a good point uh, that you raised. Because then industry might see value in coming forward and, you know, uh, integrating these processes in their work. There's so much uh, segregation between what industry does, that would say a set of the practice, which is like the owners of bridges, here, departments of transportation, and what really academia is doing. So I'm trying to kind of make it closer. It can be uh, at the cost of maybe reducing the depths of research at some point, but I think in the long run, it pays off because we also can understand what, is, what are the practical challenges, what they need and what, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what can be done to help them in a sense. So let me see, I have also one question. Uh, Sina is asking, could you please explain more about the effect of noisy data in training for SOVN and when the... Yeah, uh, Sina, the, the thing is that uh, we used POD modes for as damage features. The input was not uh, a strain signal. It was POD modes of signals. And uh, that is very robust to measurement noise. So, we try to eliminate it that way. And in the paper that I referred you to, I showed that even up to 20% of white noise, which is different from uh, probably real noise, up to 20% of white noise was not influencing the results and performance. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, with this, you. I will give it back to uh, Christian for closing the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Yastar, for this uh, very interesting and very uh, brilliant presentation. We really appreciate your collaboration. My pleasure. Um, to finish this session, I would like to invite you guys to the next uh, presentation that is going to occur again in January because of you know the end of year uh, festivities uh, we, we shifted uh uh the presentation today's presentation to to the to this day but the the next presentation is going to occur on january 31st this is going to be monday and it's going to be by dr hey young no from uh, stanford university she's going to talk about using uh ambient vibrations as a sensor to detect uh human activities and other types of uh <clears throat> activities in a, in a structure so you're all invited you can uh, log into the or you know go into the website and register and you will be notified shortly before the the presentation with the link of the of the meeting so thank you all for being here we appreciate your time and the effort to uh, be with us and have a great rest of the month take care <laughs>